Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Um, to all our distinguished panelists, moderators, and participants, I say welcome to the HSG Abuja 2020 convening. My name is Oki Kiodubadijo, and it's my privilege and pleasure on behalf of HSG Africa Regional Networks and the Systems Development Initiative to welcome you here today to this important event. We are delighted to have you with us. Um, we know that for many of you to have taken your time out of your busy schedule to join us despite individual challenges um, from COVID, the new normal, um, reminds us well enough just how important it is good for us or how we want or how much better we want health systems and health policies that work for us. So um, the team for this conference or this convening, as you all know, is strengthening capacities for HPSR or Health Policy and Systems Research Leadership in Nigeria. The team was born out of the realization of the gaps that we have in evidence to policy in Nigeria due on one hand to the limited use of research findings by policymakers and communities. And on the other hand, an inadequate and insufficient capacity to produce and use evidence in the country. But today we are all here and um, we are gathered here to address this gap by meaningfully engaging key audiences across the government, the private sector, the academia and the media to share insights, to collaborate and problem solve together on issues that will drive policy forward in Nigeria. Um, so before we go on, I would like to mention that this event is an initiative of the Health Systems Global HSG and has been made possible through their funding and partnerships with other local platforms and organizations. So before we also move on, I would like to speak briefly about the collaborating organizations that made this um, um, event happen. So first, like I said, is HSG, which is Health Systems Global. Um, it's, it's a growing membership organization of researchers, decision makers, and implementers who are dedicated to promoting HPSR and knowledge generation. It started in 2012, and their vision is to support health systems to attain better health, equity, and well being by strengthening health policy and systems research capacity in national, at national level and at community level. Their mission is also, the way they want to do this is to connect and engage everyone, including researchers, policymakers, health managers, and everyone concerned, whether remotely or proximally, to the issue of generating and using evidence for policy. And um, that's why we are gathered here today. Um, right now, HSG also has regional memberships across the world. HSG as an organization has more than 1,600 members in over 110 countries. And this event that we are having in Nigeria is a brainchild of the African Regional Networks, which is also a network of African-based researchers and practitioners, meant to make them interact and share knowledge at regional, country, and community level. So um, just in case you were wondering how to join the network, the link is there, which you can go to on, on HSG's website. Um, the instructions to join are also made available there. So um, HSG yeah, provided the assistance, but there were a lot of other, a couple of other local organizations that also partnered with, partnered with HSG to make this event happen. The first is the Systems Development Initiative, which is um, an organization from, founded in 2020 this year, and it's a platform dedicated to promoting evidence-informed health and development policies in Nigeria and beyond. Right now, we, um, the membership is just few, consisting 15 members. 
which um, you can see on your screen. So other collaborating organizations include the Health Reform Foundation of Nigeria, HEFON, which is a non-profit organization dedicated to addressing and improving health indices in Nigeria. Then, of course, the national, um, the Nigeria Implementation Science Alliance, which is also a collaboration to support. Um, it started out as a collaboration with PEPFAR-supported implementing partners, research universities, and policymakers to enhance the quality of healthcare through implementation science um, and beyond. So, um, I am happy to to present to you the aims of the convenings, which are also to engage our, each other on this platform and other key audiences in order to share insights, to collaborate, and to problem solve together to drive improved outcomes in HPSR, especially in Nigeria and beyond. So another output we also want from this, um, this convening is to identify gaps, the opportunities, the strategies, um, and the stakeholders to increase participatory leadership for HPSR at national and subnational levels. So um, I will just quickly go and introduce um, our first discussion for today. The first um, session, which is 1A, titled Closing the Inequality Gaps in Health Systems and Policy Research Capacities and Leadership in Nigeria. So um, this session will be moderated by Adaobi Ezek. Ezeo Koli, who will be moderating the session. Um, Adaobi is the editor-in-chief of Nigeria Health Watch, which is a NGO, non-governmental organization working in the areas of health communication and strategy. Adaobi is also the communications expert. She's a communications expert with over 12 years of experience in communication, media development, and journalism. She's a public health expert as well with expertise in health communications, evidence-based scientific writing, qualitative and quantitative research. Adaobi also doubles as the director of EPRFRI, which is a public health consultancy and research firm. Adaobi is the 2019 Obama Foundation African Leaders. So Adaobi will be moderating this session, but we are also honored to have esteemed individuals, um, seasoned individuals who are, have also devoted much of their work and time to achieving equity within health systems generally, um, Nigeria not excluded. So with us today, um, we have three panelists, um, Dr. Sheya Bimbola, Dr. Francis, Frances Ilika, and Dr. Ejemai Eboreme. Um, I, I have to mention here that um, we had plans for other panelists to join us, but due to extenuating circumstances, they are unable to make it. But I'll just go ahead and introduce our panelists. Dr. Frances Ilika is the country director of USAID funded Health Policy Plus Project Nigeria. She's a public health specialist and health economist with extensive experience in health system strengthening, also health financing and health governance in Nigeria. She has several health financing and um, health system strengthening diagnostic studies and has provided technical support towards the implementation of several reforms in Nigeria including the state health insurance scheme, the basic health care provision fund, and the primary health care strengthening um, initiative. Dr. Ilika is passionate about improving health systems and about achieving universal health coverage, as well as eradicating inequities and poverty in Nigeria and beyond. Dr. Shea Bimbola is um, our second panelist and is a senior lecturer in global health at the University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, he's currently the editor-in-chief of British Medical Journal Global Health, popularly known as BMG Global Health. Um, Dr. Sheya Bimbola is a health systems researcher, and he has quite a number of studies. A lot of, he has done a lot of work, actually, on community engagement in governance, in decentralized governance, and the role of governance in the adoption and scale-up of health systems innovation. Um, Dr. Bimbola is also currently the Prince Claus Chair in Global Health and Development, at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, our last, our third panelist is Dr. Ejemai Eboreme. He's a physician with postgraduate training in, and expertise in public health. He's the first um, PhD holder in Africa on implementation science and is also a health systems researcher. He's currently a postdoctoral researcher on global mental health and implementation science at the University of Alberta, Canada. He's PMI certified at Project Management International and is a project management professional, also with over 12 years 
of experience in global health, health system strengthening, community and primary health care. Dr. Eboremi has worked as a clinician, as a program manager, as an advisor, and as a consultant at both government, govern, government and non-governmental organizations in various African countries. He's also a member of several global health implementation science and health policy systems networks, such as the Society for Implementation for Research Collaboration, Nigeria, Implementation Science Alliance, and Health Systems Global. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to let you know that all our moderators and panelists, they are bringing in their experience, their passion, and knowledge of how health systems can identify and overcome systemic injustices and inequities to reach segments of the population who are frequently overlooked or bypassed. So I'm happy to let you know to prepare yourself to be challenged, to be excited, to be inspired, but more importantly, to begin the quest for solutions, to finding solutions to existing inequality within the Nigerian health system and beyond. So before I hand over to the moderator, I once more want to say a big thank you on behalf of HSG Africa Regional Networks and the Systems Development Initiative. You are very much welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Badejo, for that introduction. I will ask my panelists to please you know, unmute themselves. And if you're going to be using your video, so turn your video on at this time. Welcome again, everyone. And um, I'm excited to moderate this panel on closing, uh, closing the in inequity gaps in health systems and policy research capacities and leadership in Nigeria. We are um, on the clock, so I am going directly to my questions. And I will prompt the panelists um, to, I'll prompt the panelists to, to reply. So, for my first question, I wanted to ask the panelists to reflect on if you're looking at the Nigerian health system, what are those glaring inequities that are enshrined in our system um, that must be addressed if Nigeria is to have any hope of making progress towards SDG 3 um, in, by, by 2030? Now, I know that if we begin to talk about the health inequities um, in the country that we could be here all day, but we are looking at, we know that there's, there's evidence that social factors, education, employment status, income level, gender and ethnicity, you know, all have an influence on a person's health. But if you're looking at the Nigerian health system and looking at 2030, which is in 10 years, what, what from your perspective as an HPSR practitioner as those, um, are those inequities that are enshrined in our system that Nigeria must begin to address. And Dr. Ivika, if you can hear me, I would like to start with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adat. Um, hello, everyone. It's great to be here. So, um, Ada, you're quite correct that um, we have a lot of um, inequities within our health system. And these inequities are not just peculiar to health they are driven by a lot of other factors that we like to call social determinants of health, including education, um, in gender inequity, water, as well as uh, um, area of uh, settlement, you know, all these things actually um, affect individuals' ability to access healthcare that they need without suffering financial hardship you know, in keeping with the goals of universal health coverage. So, of course, that we, um, the latest uh, NDHS 2018 actually gives us a lot of evidence with regards to some of this. It's quite clear. You know, for instance, um, on the five mortality rates, is actually 170 per thousand with, where mothers have no education as compared with just 57 per thousand where the mothers have secondary education. And of course, it's not surprising that um, this, of course, stems from the fact that facility delivery, of course, also is less where the mother has no education, about 14%, unlike where the mother has secondary education of 88%. This um, cuts across all the other several areas. For instance, you actually find even in the areas of uh, gender equity, the NDHS is actually a very rich um, source of um, evidence that actually shows how these inequities are impacting 
people's access to healthcare in the first instance, which increases their chances of survival, as well as the health outcomes that they experience, be it maternal mortality, childhood mortality. And these are the indices that are making Nigeria to look bad. So we even find things like gender inequity, for instance, households where the mothers take part in decision making are actually more likely to access health care for their children as well as for the mothers, which reduced maternal and infant mortality. And this, of course, is more where the mothers are educated or have a source of income. So you can see that all these SDGs are actually linked together, you know, what SDG 1, if you're talking about poverty reduction, economic growth, um, um, SDG 8, and all of that. So basically, trying to get to the root of the problem, we, I would, there are a lot of problems with our Nigerian health system and how these um, inequities are actually impacting the health system. But I would like to focus on three key mechanisms that this happens. One of it is through out-of-pocket expenditures, the way that we pay to access healthcare. The way that we currently pay to access healthcare, the National Health Accounts um, 2016 actually says that um, health spending, 75% of the health spending in Nigeria is from out of pocket expenditures. So what does this mean? What this means is that people who don't have any money or who cannot afford to pay at a particular time cannot access the healthcare that they need. And even though um, another interesting thing is that when you look at the total health expenditure per capita, you'll find out that it's about $70 per capita, which is close to the $86 per capita that is recommended. But when you look at the government health expenditure per capita, you actually see it's about $13 per capita. So what this means is that the money is being spent, but only by people who can afford it. Now, who are the people who actually get sick the more? It is the poor people. So it explains very vividly why we're having this poor indices because the people who need it the most are not able to address it, are not able to access it. So what this tells us is that we have to address financial barriers to health through changing from the way we currently finance our health system to prepayment, you know, pooling, strategic purchasing through mechanisms that are already in place. And Nigeria has a lot of excellent policies that are already there that would address this. And I'll get to that very shortly. Now, another area I would like to focus on, which is the second area, is regards to availability of care. So you find out that even when people can afford this care, depending on where you reside, if you live, for instance, in the urban slum or in the rural area, you may find out that when you go to the health facility there, there are no human resources for health because they would rather stay in the cities and in better places. You have poor infrastructure, drugs, equipment, and all that. So the availability of these services, quality services, is not even there as well. So this is also driving the inequities that is giving us this bad indices. And then finally, the third thing that is also driving this is health-seeking behavior. And we can also see that this is also linked to the inequities that we're talking about. So women who are not educated are less likely to access care for themselves and for their children. Um, in one of the states where we were supporting the setting up of state health insurance scheme, they actually told us that, look, even if you put everything in these centers, people will not go. They prefer the traditional mechanisms. So how do we begin to address all of this? And I had earlier mentioned that Nigeria has some great policies that have been put into place. One of them is the Basic Healthcare Provision Fund, which stems from 1% of the Consolidated Revenue um, Fund of Nigeria. And the second one is the state health insurance scheme. A lot of states are putting at least 1% of their state consolidated revenue fund to provide for the poor and vulnerable through the health insurance schemes. So that is the new financing mechanism we need to go towards, a prepayment mechanism where governments, uh, people who, who have formal jobs will have payroll deductions, people, the informal sector non-poor will contribute. And we need to find out mechanisms to get them to contribute. The poor people who cannot contribute, the governor will have to pay for them through the equity funds and, of course, through the basic healthcare provision fund. So that is what we need to um, actually go move towards to begin to address this. And then very finally, to mention that another thing we need to do to address these issues is we need to think multi-sectoral. So multi-sectoral collaboration is very key. All those other factors that contributes, those social determinants and all that, education and economic growth and all of that will also need to be taken mm -hmm. into perspective if we want to see real improvements um, and real growth in this. Now, what are some of the things that will help us to know how to do it, when to do it, where to do it? Is 
health systems and policy research. And I guess that is why we're having this question. And I'm sure that we'll get to um, a later part of the discussion where we talk about how do we use HPSR to actually drive these reforms. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Elita, for those um, insightful points. Um, financial barriers to health being a problem, availability of care, and then health-seeking behaviors. Um, we are taking notes. I'd like to go to Dr. Eboriame. Ibor Please, can you weigh in on this question? Um, what for you are those glaring inequities um, that we need to address? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ada. I think um, I wouldn't want to repeat what um, Dr. Adika has said, but I would want to contradict what you have said. Yeah, so you did mention that there is, uh, that you asked what are the glaring inequalities or inequities we have in Nigeria. And I would want to say that there are no glaring inequalities and I will explain myself. Um, something glares only when people can see it. And unfortunately, there is a whole lot, that we, we, we live in a system of injustice, a system of inequities and inequalities that that abnormality has become normal and it's no more glaring. We don't recognize that there, is, that there are actual inequities in our system. And so we are not, we, 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 we don't actually make meaningful efforts to address them. Um, we can't talk about um, inequalities or inequities without addressing the issue of power. Inequality is out of our power. Some people have the power, some don't, and those who don't have the power are unable to access um, care, the care they need. And um, Dr. Elika did mention, she, had, she did an analysis of um, uh, healthcare expenditure in Nigeria and said that about uh, 75, I think I also saw, saw somewhere on World, on World Bank that it's actually approaching 77% is out of uh, out-of-pocket expenditure. And we also, um, uh, and, and, and government expenditure is roughly about 20% or thereabout, and um, uh, donor expenditure on health is just about 3.5 or thereabout. And um, when you look at this spectrum of expenditure for health, you realize that um, you ask yourself some critical questions. Who makes the, who has the greatest influence or power in deciding what goes on, um, who, uh, what policies are made in the country for health. Uh, we know that government, um, through its mechanisms, through its structure, um, makes that ultimate top-down decision for health. Uh, but we also know that um, not only in Nigeria, in many, in most um, uh, low- and middle-income countries, um, donor power is power. And you... Uh, and and, and donor, donor uh, power actually influences a whole lot of government decisions such that they set in the, uh, uh, priorities for um, healthcare decision making. And uh, when you think about this analysis that um, those who spend less than 4%, who contribute less than 4% to health expenditure, or those who spend um, about 20%, make the decision for those who, have, who spend about 77%, that is inequity. Because the people who, and, 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 and knowing that these guys who, that's the populace now who spend a whole lot of their money financing the health system, because I, I want us to look at it from that perspective, that this is contribution towards the health system of Nigeria. And knowing that the people who, um, who are supposed to benefit from the health system and contribute more, even though uh, more diverse, and it's coming from several people, but are, the, are those who suffer the greatest um, deficiencies in access to care, it becomes a problem. And I think this is the kind of things we should begin to see and begin to address, if we begin to recognize it this way. Unfortunately, like I said, our eyes are, we have this, we have a, a, um, some social political cataract that makes us not see and these problems are not glaring, and yet they persist within our system. And so we need to think about how we need to address them because um, like a quote I, 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 um, I love so much, um, that says every system is perfectly designed to get, the, to get the results it gets. 
um, in the in Nigerian health system, we keep on year after year spending money, creating programs, um, trying to see how we can improve healthcare indices. And over the years, we have realized that it is not, uh, we are actually not doing much. Um, we are not actually not getting much results, even though we are doing so much. And that means we should go back again and look, go back again and look into our systems and ask ourselves critical questions. Are we actually doing the right thing? Is our system designed to actually produce the right results? I think it, this is where it begins. We need to interrogate our system, interrogate ourselves, interrogate our culture, interrogate our perspective to things. Think about the issue of power. Think about who actually should be making should, uh, should be on the table in terms of decisions. I I would expect that in normal um, uh, yeah. If you want if you want to talk about uh, if we want to focus on equity, we should think about how we can bring the seventy seven percent spenders to the table in planning. But that is not the case. How often right. do we get grassroots perspective when it comes to decision making in healthcare? I think we should interrogate these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ibarame. And um, several things that you spoke about, the abnormalities are becoming normal. And as a result, they are no longer glaring. And I think that's a question, that's a, a thought that we need to constantly um, bring back to the table. How do we make sure that these inequities don't get hidden, as you said? And then you talked about the social and political cataract in the eyes of the Nigerian health system. Um, interesting quotes for the day. Dr. Abimbola, um, what would you like to add to the conversation? Thank you very much for having me and, and thank you very much to the, um, my fellow panelists who have spoken already. Um, there's nothing to disagree with uh, about all that they've said. Um, but what I want to do, I think, is step back a little bit sort of zoom out. Uh, because when you ask the question um, the first time, you use the word enshrined. Uh, and whenever you hear the word enshrined, you think constitution, right? It, it's, it's often, um, uh, is the word that often follows the word enshrined, sort of in the constitution. Uh, and I think that there's a lot to think about um, how Nigeria's constitution itself um, by virtue of it being a federalized constitution um, is in a sense comfortable with inequalities. Right? So every, every federalized state, the United States, Indonesia, India, you can name them, they are all states with sort of large states to start with, but also states that are um, widely varying in terms of ethnicity, and religion um, and geography, such that um, when those entities come together to form a country, there is some sort of tacit agreement that there will be a level of inequality because each entity is governed differently. And the same thing plays out in Nigeria. And, and I often, uh, we don't begin our conversation about inequalities and inequities in our health system from that place. And, and I think it's perhaps the most consequential place to begin. Um, Dr. Elika mentioned um, state health insurance scheme. Um, and, and someone was already asking a question in the chat room about why you know, some state, most states are, don't seem to be implementing it. Again, it goes back to the constitution. Right? We have a constitution that sort of tacitly agrees that some states will do well and so on. And in, in some sense, we can't have a holistic discussion about inequities without thinking very clearly and carefully about how the central government of Nigeria will work with states to ensure some level of equity in how um, health, the health sector operates. So, so that, that's one perspective that I want to bring to the conversation. We are extremely decentralized. Um, we're a country that is comfortable with inequalities, especially between states. Um, and we can't strengthen our health system without beginning from that place. Now, the second point that I want to make is about um, health care being only a very tiny contributor to health outcomes. There's been a lot of talk on this panel about sort of out-of-pocket expenditure, um, insurance, etc., and all of that 
sort of those factors are important and they will contribute to health. But as Dr. Elika mentioned at, at the beginning as well, um, women who are educated, their children die less. It is not just because the children go to the hospital. It is because there are many other factors that are ruled into being educated as a woman. Right? So, so there are factors that have to do with um, your income as that woman, um, and your ability to um, make sure that your children drink proper water, they are, they are vaccinated. All of those things sort of roll into that. And so when, when we talk about inequities as well, the inequity, our, our lens on what contributes to that has to be much, much broader than what healthcare could possibly do. Uh, and we have to think again about the way in which the country itself is structured in a way that allows for certain people in certain places to have access to social services, including health, and, and for others not to. And again here, think about inequities between urban and rural settings, which again, um, uh, Ejemai and Dr. Elika have already mentioned. And these are all, again, as, as Ejemai said, these things have become such a part of our life that we don't even see it as clearly anymore. And, and we not only not see it clearly, but we also don't see the factors that underlie them. Right? The, the, the structure of the country, I keep coming back to that, and it's not just because I studied decentralization, but because I know being a Nigerian that that is where the rubber hits the road. Right? We can't talk about inequity without talking about who's responsible for it. Right? Again, in, in that place, power, power plays a huge role. Um, and if we are going to strengthen our health system, we are going to have to acknowledge that we have at least 36 health systems. In the country, and each of them requires a heavy dose of support, financially and technically, to make sure that they can serve the people that they are designed and put in place to serve. Thank you so much, Dr. Abimbola, for those points. Um, I really like that you took us back to the foundation, which is looking at the very way that we are structured as a nation and how that can breed. Um, inequality or inequities if we do not address those. Um, and also looking just as other other panelists have mentioned, looking at the cross-cutting issues, that healthcare is just one part um, of ensuring that somebody has a healthy life throughout, you know, throughout, um, yeah, throughout their life. I want to pivot to, um, so to those who are listening, thank you, please, if you have questions, kindly put them in the Q&A chat box. Kindly put them, put your questions down so that at the end of this conversation, we will take questions um, to panelists um, if we have time. So I'd like to pivot to uh, a, a different, sort of a slightly connected but different topic. And I think um, Dr. Elika alluded, uh, alluded to it when she talked about how those who are the poorest usually don't have access to health care. And we know that health inequities are unfair, but we also know that they can be reduced by the right mix of government policies. And the process of policy formulation usually starts from research all the way up to um, adopting a policy, implementing it, evaluating a policy. So it's, it's a spectrum. And sometimes community's voice uh, or community's voice is not reflected in the final policy because that work to include the community in the very adoption, the very, in the very formulation of the policy hasn't been done. So I wanted to ask um, your, the, the experts on this panel come from a wide range of organizations and spaces. When you're looking at po policy formulation and research, what should governments and CSOs, what should researchers, what should universities um, in Nigeria be doing to ensure that our communities are involved from right from the development of research questions through implementation, through policy formulation? How should we, how, how should these bodies um, be ensuring that we don't lose that community voice? Because policies then can be responsive to the community when they take note of what the community actually needs. And Dr. Ejimai, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, thank you once again. Um, I think I'll just begin from where I stopped previously um, and uh, talk about the issue of power again. Um, the problems in our country is really complex. 
and unfortunately we can't really address this in this short discussion, but it's good we are talking about this here. And we want to, and I want to say that for that that, that um, what you have talked about um, that the process of policy formula, of of policy um, development and implementation begins with evidence. That is ideal, right? That's what's expected, but that's not what is real. Um, I have worked across various spectrums in terms of uh, worked in the research um, uh, sector. I've worked in policy making, I've worked in civil society, I've worked with donor organizations. So I realized that what drives um, policy making currently for us um, is not what you've talked about. It's not about evidence, it's more about interest and power. And unfortunately, um, it's not just a Nigerian thing I think um, that's the way the world is shaped. The world has always been about power, even though we pretend that we want to do what is right. We, we, we pretend that we, 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 we want to um, do things for the people, but the truth is um, we do things for those who are in a, uh, in position of power. And in that, to address inequalities with respect to this, we need to look at these interests and this power and see how we can interrogate them. And um, Adam Speed said something. He said, it's not by the benevolence of the butcher um, or the baker that we get our daily bread. But as each one of them work to, um, to, 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 to get their own selfish interest, they work for the good of all. I'm just paraphrasing. So um, if you look at Nigeria's political structure or political system, or, and as with any other country in the world, and the fact that politicians who make the ultimate decisions go there to, to advance their own interests. And um, donors who also come to the country come to advance their own interests. Um, the people who require health, healthcare optimized, have their own interest, which is that. And that should be, actually be the center of, 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 of the health system, but unfortunately it's not. So how do we advance this? Um, I think the only way we can we, we can actually um, tackle this is um, is through civil society. I think from, because in, um, from my observation with various policies that have evolved over time in Nigeria, um, you cannot um, you cannot bring evidence to a politician and expect him to implement when it doesn't meet his own interest. So advocacy just seems to be the only way, and it's a long, long, long way. Uh, we could see, for example, the National Health Act. Um, for those who are aware or who are part of the process, you saw how I mean, it took about 10 or 11 years to, to, and went through various phases in which in, the, the, the policy got torn apart, rebuilt, destroyed, and became a hybrid of various things finally when it was passed. And that is the way it will keep on evolving. And if we're going to address um, issues of, um, if we're going to get uh, more people, uh, people um, on the table, it will keep on being about advocacy, pressure, and fight, nobody is going to give up his power or interest for the people. But except those who, except the, except those who come from the people um, and fight for that, for the people's interest. I think that's the only way I can see it. We could be on the table every time uh, as researchers talk about evidence-informed policy making and hoping that um, somehow um, statistics or um, research would be what will ultimately decide what policy would be, but I think it's all about interest and how um, how, how um, the power of the people can tilt the table to get some benefit um, to the people. I really, frankly, don't see any other way around it. Thank you, thank you, HMI. So, civil society then using the evidence generated possibly by researchers to appeal to the interests of politicians. Is what I hear you. Saying. Yes, exactly. And and sorry, let me just say something briefly in addition to that. That um, that also means that civil society needs to get the capacity needed to uh, to assess evidence, to appraise evidence, um, to inform the advocacy. Because again, if um, civil society um, it, it, capacity is not built in this direction, they can advocate for the wrong things, thinking it's right. the right thing. Understand yeah. the evidence. That they are that they are using to yeah sure. great thank you so much Dr Abimbola kindly weigh in yeah um, in, in in answering this question 
two, two, two experiences that I've had um, sort of come, come to mind. Um, the first one um, was when I, when I was working at the National Primary Healthcare Agency. I was working on, um, in Nigeria, in Abuja. I was working on an HIV program. And one of the, the, the tasks we needed to do was to reactivate the community structures for primary healthcare governance. And what was striking in, in the interviews that we had and discussions in Tarakoki with community members was that they didn't think of HIV. They didn't think in terms of diseases. Right? They, they thought in terms of the system. Um, often when we are trying to ask questions of communities, we, we go to them um, with how we see the world. And we expect them to see the world in the same way we do, and sort of think of diseases, think of these little bits and pieces, whereas they see whole systems. First point. Second example is um, a, a chance encounter that I had with a very, very senior person in the Ministry of Finance in Nigeria, whose name I can't mention. This person used to be also be a very, very senior person in a state government ministry of finance. Now, those who know Nigeria really well probably know this person already. But I met with this person and we were having a conversation around communities and what communities want and, and why the government is not um, um, devoting enough funds to health. And this person said to me, but Nigerians don't really prioritize health, you know? But when, when we go and ask them, what they want. When we go to the communities and ask people what they want, they don't say they want health. They say they want good roads. They say they want a community center where they can have meetings. They say, at least have like five or six things that they say they want, and they hardly ever mention health. And what struck me in that conversation was that those are the social determinants of health. People don't see, again, don't see the world the way we do. Right? They, see, they see broader things. Right? They interpret their lives as they live it on a day-to-day -day basis. Most people don't go to the hospital on a day-to-day -day basis. They use the things that, lead, that, that determine their health on a day-to-day -day basis. They use water every day, they use roads every day. They need community centers pretty much every day. But they don't see their, their world the way that we will frame it and ask them. And I've, I've, I've given these two examples to show that, that engagement can, we can engage and not ask, get the answers that are uh, that, that, that in engaging, we should be careful about how we interpret what we hear. And, and in engaging, we should understand that the people we are engaging with see the world from a different place mm. compared to us. And if you want to engage really truly, and if you want to solve problems, you know, roots, uh, from the roots, um, from, from, from the foundations, we have to learn to see the world in the same way as the people we are trying to help and support see the world. And they don't see their world in terms of diseases or even health facilities. They see the world in holes, in complex, multi-sectoral ways. It is also think in sectors and in diseases. They don't think in those ways. They think in children and lives and livelihoods, which is a completely different way of seeing the world, right? And it, it just strikes me that, that that is something we, as researchers and policymakers, have to have at the back of our minds when we're engaging with communities that we don't see the world. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Abimbola, for bringing out that issue of context. You can't solve a problem unless you understand how the person yes. sees the problem. Um, Dr. Elika, I'd like you to weigh in on this question and then we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adan. Thank you very much to Dr. Shea and um, um, Ejemai for those excellent points. I'll try not to repeat them, but I'll try to move to, you know, what do we need to do differently? because it's already well understood fact that there are breaks where linkages should be. So for instance, we need linkages between researchers and communities, including CSOs, the healthcare providers that provide these services, the healthcare managers, academia, people in institutions who are doing this research, implementers of these reforms, government policy makers, donors and partners that are funding some of this research. We need those linkages to be in place. And why we need those linkages to be in place is that we need to, like you mentioned earlier, that we need to talk about that multi-sectoral approach to research from the start to the end. 
and it needs to be a continuous cycle. So when we're talking about research, in framing the research question, who is there? So a lot of times we have um, people in academia, institutions, developing research questions, conducting research that nobody has use for. And uh, you have people, policymakers and implementers, having a lot of burning questions and challenges that they need answers to, and nobody's researching on those. How do we cross those linkages? And then of course, I won't emphasize, uh, the Dr. Shea already emphasized it, the needs of the community. To what extent are these researchers that we're churning out from academic institutions, research organizations, speaking to the needs of the community? How are they involved? So we must join those lines, those gaps that are there. We must establish those linkages. And what are some of the ways that we can do that? We need to take a very conscious approach to this. So first of all, we need a very good solid research agenda. This should not be cast in stone. It can be a yearly research agenda that is put out by um, ministries of health at the federal level, at the state level, and it needs very strong government commitment and leadership. And the people that will lead this will be the particular um, departments within the ministries of health that are taxed with this. So in my experience, I've actually experienced um, health finance and technical working groups, both at the national level and at the state level. And these are multi-sectoral in nature, where you have people from CSOs, you know, the executives, healthcare providers, OICs from rural primary healthcare organizations, sometimes being part of this, people from the Emirates Council. And I've, I've actually met some highly intelligent and knowledgeable people from traditional, you know, councils and leaderships and communities. This is where the conversations about what to research on should be had, not some uh, researcher in his room, you know, thinking of ideas from his head. So we need to establish these linkages and we need to talk about how do we do it in practice. So we have to walk the talk. We've been talking about it for a while. So we need that very concrete research agenda that the ministry is responsible puts out at the end of every year to say, these are the burning questions based on our conversations, our interactions, the CSOs are there, you know, everybody's there. These are our burning questions that we need access to. As we try to implement policies, we know that in Nigeria, we have a lot of problems with policy implementation. As we try to implement policies, these are our challenges. And we need answers. For instance, how do we get the informal sector non-poor, what we call the missing middle, to contribute to health insurance? That is a question. So how do we get these questions? And then the third stage is, how do we get these questions to the researchers? So there needs to be a mechanism in place to actually disseminate this research agenda to the people who are doing the research, including institutions, both foreign and within Nigeria, to donors, to partners that are funding this research. The health institutions within the ministries of health also need to have their own research agenda and budgets. So it needs to be included in the government budget for the year and their capacities will need to be built for them to be able to drive this research. For instance, we've been talking about institutionalizing the national health accounts, you know, and some of these ways that we can collect data and generate this data. So the community members need to be part of framing the question. After framing the question, the research itself, this multi-sectoral body also needs to be part of this research, collecting the data and all of that and interpreting the findings of this research. So we should have that mechanism where we present this to them and say, do you think that this is what people are trying to tell us? Is this what we need to do? Coming up with solutions about what needs to happen. And then taking this evidence that has been generated into policy making, using it to engage policymakers, legislators, Nigerian governors forum and all of that to say, we need you to make policies using this evidence. And then after these policies are made, implementation of these uh, policies, as well as the monitoring, with regards to is it yielding the desired effects? The CSOs, the communities need to play a very key role. So one of the mechanisms I've, be, I've seen in place, like I mentioned earlier, is the technical health financing, technical working groups in the states that have this. This can actually set for this um, purpose, but they need to be strengthened and they need to be driven. Government leadership and ownership is going to be key to make sure that we actually use some of these um, platforms. I'm sure there are a lot of other platforms and maybe Department of Research um, Statistics have other technical working groups and all that, but we need to consciously develop a research agenda, put in place platforms for actually implementing this research agenda and then monitoring and tracking and making sure it fits into policy, 
policy is implemented and we track and see the success of the implementation of those policies. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Ilika. Um, thank you. I, I like the way you presented sort of what we need to do. This issue of linkages is quite important. We can't just continue to do work in silos. So the strong linkage from the researchers straight to a policy implementation and bringing a community voice in. Um, it's something you said that I thought was key. When we are framing the research question, who is there? Who is at the table? If we don't have this multi-sectoral approach, then we are just going to keep going around in circles when it comes to getting community voice involved in our, um, in, in, in our policies. I've seen that um, questions are dropping. Thank you so much. We will try as much as possible to get to as many of them as we can. But before we do, um, I do have another topic to discuss with the panel. So for the panelists to give us their insights on which is one that is around um, decolonization of global health. Uh, we know that there's been a lot of conversations now around um, decolonizing global health. So I wanted to ask, how do we ensure that there are more equitable partnerships with the Global North countries to benefit health research and policy in Nigeria? That's one side. So we've, we've gone from the community and now we're looking at research from the global perspective. How do we ensure partnerships um, with High income countries that are former former colonizers, how do they how do we ensure that we have more equitable partnerships with with these countries? And then secondly, how should Nigeria reduce over dependence on donor support to carry out research and begin to develop this strong multi-sectoral system that um, the panelists have spoken about? And Dr. Abimbola, I'll come to you first for this question. Thank you. Um, it's, it's a very big question, uh, and it's a very current question as well. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you can hear you. Yeah, it's just that my internet is unstable. Um, it's a big question, it's a current question, uh, and it's a question that has very many parts. Um, but I'll try to be as um, uh, basic as possible. Uh, in terms of what we need to do, um, we can think of it in two ways. Um, First, the global north, whatever it is we call the global north, but it's a very amorphous um, entity. But the global north needs to lean out. Um, but in them leaning out, we also need to lean in. Right? Now, a lot of the debate around decolonization has been about the global north leaning out. And that, that is, it is my, uh, it makes me unsettled when we are not talking about how we need to lean in, right? Because we, the, even if the global north wants to lean out, we have to be willing to lean in as well. If they don't want to lean out, we have to be willing to lean in, right? So whichever the case, we must be willing to lean in. And by leaning in, here, here is what I mean. Um, If a donor has an agenda, if we know what we want, most of the time we can get the donor to do exactly what we want. We know, we know that that is true because Rwanda exists. Right? And I'm speaking among Nigerians now. If I was speaking in the much more closed room, I would tell you all my concerns about Rwanda. But in spite of all my concerns about Rwanda, I promise you, they get that right. They, they can reshape and they reshaped consistently the agenda of their donors. And if we want to, again, if we want to lean in, we must be willing to do that. Now, doing that requires that we get our own house in order. Now, the, there's a saying, again, it's a Yoruba saying that if, if, the, if there's no crack in the world, I know the Yoruba version much better than the English, there's no crack in the world, the lizard cannot enter. So we, we have to make sure that we have our own house in order. And to do that, our universities have to be committed to doing exactly what we've been talking about, right? solving real problems of real people. Now, if our eyes, if the eyes of researchers are set on real problems of real people, and someone comes and says, solve my artificial foreign-imposed silly problem, we know exactly what to say. 
I'm not sure that we know what to say now, frankly. I'm not sure that we do know what to say. If, if we know exactly what we are looking for, if our priorities are in order, if our eyes are set in the right place, donors and funders will listen to us and we re re reorder their priorities to align with what we want. The second point that I want to make in, in relation to that, in, in getting our own house in order, as I mentioned um, when I first, uh, my first <laughs> intervention, um, we have 36 health systems. If you're a researcher, and I used to be one, so I'm not insulting anyone um, without insulting myself. If you're a researcher who works at the federal level, be sure that you are very likely solving a very surface problem. Again, those who have engaged at the state level and at the local council level know that that's where the rubber hits the road. If you're not working there, you're very likely, you know, just <laughs> taking care of yourself. When I used to work at NPXCDA, um, there was a big funder, uh, um, two of them, whom I always begged to go to the states. Don't bring your money to the federal level. You're just wasting your time. People are going to take your money. Um, and and the, the attrition will be so high that when the money finally gets to the community, it's, it's almost all gone. Um, if I had more power, maybe I would have pursued them. But I kept trying at every meeting. I would say, why don't you? engage with the state. Why are you coming here? Um, and then they will sort of agree with me and understand my point and they will sort of say, yeah, I can see what you're saying. The next meeting, they will revert it to where they were before. Because there's this megalomania in the mind of donors that they want to work in Nigeria. And if they're not working at the federal level, they're not working in Nigeria. I, I hope that is shifting. I've, I've not been in, in rooms where these conversations are had in a while. But, but th that's part of where we've got our house. Right? To, to know exactly where we need evidence who needs evidence to transform health systems. And for the most part, it is state governments and sometimes local councils who need the evidence to transform the system in which they're working. And if you are not providing evidence to serve their purpose, one state, one LGA after the other, then we are not solving the problem. And if our eyes are not set in, in those places as granularly, granularly as, 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 as they require, then every time a donor comes and brings their own little thing and they want to do their megalomaniac thing, we will agree with them and we'll write a fine paper and we will be happy. But that doesn't solve any problem. Sorry, I'm talking too much, but the other thing that I feel I need to say is, is that I'm currently involved in a very big evidence synthesis on the health system. of Nigeria, And what we've done is to take the building blocks, remote, modify them a little bit because I'm not a big fan of them, but essentially the building blocks. And we're looking at papers in the last 10 years on each building block. What, what I found most striking is that 95% of the papers are written by Nigerians, first or third by Nigerians in Nigerian institutions. Now, I don't think that would be true for a low income, income country or a much lower income country than we are. And what that tells me is that we have some capacity. Um, we, there's a, we have a good place to start. We're not starting from ground zero. There's a good number of academics, there's a good number of researchers publishing in Nigeria, whom if we were to again focus our attention in the right places and ask the right questions and engage with the right people, we could actually be a force, a very strong force. Thank you so much, Dr. Abimbola. Um, so many interesting nuggets from what you've said. Um, Dr. Elika, please kindly weigh in. I will do a summary at the end. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Ada. I would like to keep it short so we can have time for questions. So I just want to align with um, Dr. Shea with regards to this. So we need country ownership and leadership. If, uh, if you come to a, a meeting or a board meeting, most times it is the person who is bringing the most that everybody stops to listen to when he speaks, right? So instead of staying and blaming and saying, oh no, they're not letting us, we need to rise up to this challenge. We need to drive these efforts. We need to put these things in place. And I'll put this in perspective. Um, there's this general discussion around um, the fact that donor funding can do three things. So first of all, it can displace 
it can cause a displacement, which is what we see a lot of times and that is not good for us. That is why we're where we are. So most times donor funding comes and then um, um, uh, policymakers say, oh, donor is funding HIV, let's move away from HIV, you know, things like that or malaria or anything like that. And then there's a displacement and that is not good for us. When there's displacement, there isn't good country ownership, there isn't leadership. So we cannot drive this, the agenda, we cannot drive the reforms. And that is not good for us. Now, the second thing that donor funding can do is additionality. So it can add, you know, to what the government is currently funding. That is better than displacement, but that is still not enough. So in talking about doing development differently, we're talking about how can donor funding be catalytic? How can it catalyze, you know, government, improved government funding, improved government ownership, self-reliance, you know, that is the current discussions that we're having. And Nigeria needs to rise up to this situation. Um, a lot of what other African countries are actually improving in this regard, and we need to continue to improve. So we have some good policies. We need to try to implement them. We need to drive our research agenda. We need to decide, you know, put these mechanisms in place and say, this is how we need to do it. These are the people that we need to be involved in, and then fund it put in place budgetary mechanisms and all that, and then put in place those mechanisms. Like Shreya mentioned, in the country, there are a lot of researchers, medical students and other students actually do uh, projects, master's students mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, professors in universities have to write papers to become professors and all of that. There are other research institutions. We should share this research you know, agenda questions and what are the things we need answered and all of that to all these people so that we can begin to drive this, so that we can use government funding to drive this agenda while donor funding is catalytic and helps to build systems, build capacities, while we depend more on our own funding to solve our own problems, which is what self-reliance is all about. Thank you, Dr. Ilika. Dr. Iberma, can you kindly weigh in and then so that we can go to questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I don't know whether how, how much more I can say beyond what the two previous speakers, Shea and Francis, have, have spoken. Um, uh, she had a real good um, dissection, and Francis um, for that, uh, 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 you know, enhanced on that as well. Um, but I want to say that um, the issue of decolonization of global health um, for me is is depressing and concerning because um, there are different perspectives to it. And I think most people are getting it wrong. Um, most people see decolonization as, um, as resistance towards, um, uh, um, you know, age long Western dominance, which is true in some way, but um, I think it's more, I would like to see it more, more, more from a perspective of identity, and I think that's how, that, that's the same way the uh, previous speakers have also seen it. Because we, um, when it comes to, in, in, a, in an era of globalization, um, diffusion of culture, diffusion of ideas cannot be um, discarded. Uh, but um, who determines uh, how much you are colonized in this modern day? is uh, it depends on um, your identity of yourself. Um, even the issue of colonization as it were, when we were colonized right from uh, 18, whatever, um, these Western systems came to us to do business. And then they saw another form of business, which was getting us to sell ourselves to build their own economy. And that's how slavery started. And um, thereafter, they found, oh, um, yeah, we, we are able to get these people to do this. Why don't we take over their systems? And then the war started and they won. And um, thereafter, they now began to teach us that um, uh, Mongo Park discovered River Niger. And I didn't learn it from them that Mongo Park discovered the River Niger. I learned it from my own teachers, fellow Africans, that Mongo Park discovered the River Niger, whereas there are people who have been um, at Skyenji um, since ages past. So the thing is, we have refused, we, have, we are unable to 
see ourselves as more experts in global health. Um, as long as you do not see, because when, when we talk about global health experts, for example, we always look towards the West, unfortunately. Whereas I think that even the primary school child who is in primary six has more experience in global health because you've experienced the health system, you've been a beneficiary of it. And so I think it's, it, we need to create, a, we need to begin to have um, a new consciousness of who we are. And that's the way we can come up to the table because the, um, the countries we are talking about um, uh, decolonizing, whatever, um, they have just this, Lens in which there's a few things. I uh, like I, I I I was telling someone that what what happens is there is a, a stereotype of identity which they have seen us and then so they try to define us within that confines. When they come to Africa, they say this is how African health systems are supposed to be, and usually from a, from, from 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 the CNN light, which is the negative light, and so they define, and then they think that they are, the next thing they want to do is to refine. And refined simply means taking away the Africanness from you. Now, the, the, the experience that you've had within your own system, uh, which is essential to making your systems work, um, is taken away. And then the next thing is to redesign your system to align to what they are. And these things can, and, 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 and in all sincerity, many times these things are done, um, sometimes not all the time, but sometimes are done out of sincere thinking that this is how things can work and um uh the uh, and, and and like we have uh, talked about in previous discussions that our health system is not um isolated from our political system but we have a political system which is now a mix between our local culture and a system that was defined from us colonially so we need to sit down and ask ourselves what works for us um and begin to think to, to also realize that um we ourselves have a great degree of capacity. We have a lot to bring to the table. And so we can um, negotiate and discuss and partner um, adequately with the West. I recall a very disappointing um, scenario which I watched on TV um, some years back when that was during um, the Jonathanian era. And um, the then Minister of um, Finance had just yeah, um, led the, uh, what's it called? the is it recapitalization or whatever, where, we now, where, where our GDP now went you know, high and then we became a middle-income country. And um, a member of the House of Rep came on, came on TV to say, look, Okonje Wede has destroyed our, 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 our economy because she has made us a middle-income country. And as such, now donors are now pulling out because they think that, 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 that we, are, we are rich enough to take care of ourselves. So that, it, that mentality was not given to us by the West. We got it for ourselves. This is, this is a lawmaker saying that. He believes that Nigeria should be poor. As long as we are, Af you know, when we say, okay, um, yeah, is this not Africa? We, we have that, this attitude we have within ourselves needs to change. And I think it has to come with um, a, a, a new um, social reengineering, a new um, uh, orientation of ourselves. Uh, and, 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 and that's the only way we can go out of it. We can't, we can't keep on shouting, taking placards, say, look, decolonize global health and think that will happen. It's not going to happen. We need to begin to become aware of ourselves, uh, conscious of our capacity, conscious of, 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 of our power, and um, that's the only way we can come to the negotiation table. And of, of course, uh, um, in addition to what we are, uh, or to contribute back to what we have talked about before, we need to build capacity. We want to build capacity with more local understanding knowing fully that look, being more confident that look, we, um, there's a lot of knowledge within our system and uh, we can bring that to the table. I think that's just the only way, um, that identity. Thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim and all the panelists. Um, just to quickly summarize, so we have a ton of questions and um, obviously we cannot take all of them. I probably will take one or two in the time that I have. But to summarize what the panelists have said, you know, um, the Global North needs to lean out and we need to lean in. And something that we are not doing enough of is we are not leaning in enough. Because if there's no crack in the wall, the lizard can't get in. And something that Dr. Lika said that I really um, resonated with is that we need country ownership and leadership. We need to begin to set the agenda ourselves. And then we need to understand our identity and use that to develop ourselves and not wait for our identity to be given to us. Um, 
as HMI said. So I'm going to take one question here. And panelists, if there are questions you want, you can answer individually from the Q&A, kindly go ahead. But let me take um, one from Moses here that says, based on the fact that um, heterogeneous structure of Nigeria contributes to health inequalities in the health systems in Nigeria, how can evidence of effective health policy working in any part of the country be scaled to bridge the equity gaps in other parts of the country? Um, who would like to take this? Dr. Elika, would you like to take some of this question? Hi, thanks, Adia. I'm not exactly sure I got the question, but I think it's talking about how do we make sure that evidence leads to policy changes? Is that the question? Right. If we find an effective um, evidence of an effective health policy in one part of the country, how do we scale it to bridge equity gaps in other parts of the country? I think is the essence of the question. Right, absolutely. That is very important. And that is why we're talking about those linkages. You know, we spoke about platforms for making sure that those evidence is generated, platforms for making sure everybody is part of it. But also very importantly is the platform for dissemination of the evidence that works. Because a lot of times you find out that when people go online, they find evidence from other countries that may not apply to our context. Whereas we have a lot of programs that have been piloted with excellent results. Sometimes when you attend meetings of, you know, partners and donors and all of that, you see people presenting mechanisms that have been piloted and they work. And then you're asking yourself, when can this be scaled up to the whole of the population? So I think that's where the, where that question, that, what that question is trying to get at. To say, how do we make sure that this evidence of what works is disseminated among the country. So we need to make sure that we post this information where people can easily access them. That is one. So we need to put them in online platforms. Ministries of Health should have online platforms where they put out this information so that people can hear them. During meetings, we need to have mechanisms. For instance, I know that the Federal Ministry of Health has this meeting of DPRSs. I don't know how often it happens, but these are the kind of information that should be shared at these meetings you know, including the national health accounts, the state health accounts, as well as some of these mechanisms that have worked. There are other platforms. The Nigerian Governors Forum is a very strong platform that I have been able to use very effectively. For instance, in supporting one of the states that we support, when they were having difficulty with getting their government to release the equity fund, it was through the Nigerian Governors Forum, where a scorecard was presented of all the states, how they were scoring and all of that, and the governor felt embarrassed that his state had not released funds for poor and vulnerable. Immediately he got home, he called the head of the agency and that money got released. So that is also another platform that can be used. We have the legislative network for universal health coverage that draws legislators from all over the world. That platform can also be used. The CSO platforms, there are a lot of great CSO platforms out there, the HEFCON, the Health Sector Reform Coalition and all of that. So we have a lot of ways that we can actually disseminate this information, but it is going to take a conscious effort, like I mentioned earlier. So somebody needs to lead this process. Somebody needs to drive this process and then make this conscious effort to disseminate this information across board. And then the necessary advocacy, evidence-based advocacy that is needed to make sure that they are implemented. I would like to stop here. Maybe other panelists have things to add. I like think I'm joking. <laughs> just briefly, just one, one minute. Okay. Go ahead, Shay. Yeah, I, I, I think we um, completely, I, I, I listed a number of things that I wanted to talk about, and Dr. Lika talked about every one of them, every one of them. So, but, but just, just this one bit about academic publishing, and I'm saying this because I'm a journal editor. Um, we need an academic publishing infrastructure that can serve our health system. Um, now, I, I edit a global health journal, and global journals look for global things. Um, for, for the most part, the kinds of problems that this question speaks to are, are the kinds of lessons that you can learn from Ekiti State to Ebony State, right? Or from Benue State to Borno State. So, in a sense, local lessons learned about what has worked, how it worked, what made it work, how can the other state do similar things. 
And in addition to the policy platforms that we have where governors and commissioners and legislators speak to one another, our academic infrastructure needs to become sophisticated in a way that can also serve the purpose of lessons being learned from one point to another. We need proper journals that work and are sophisticated and are operated at a very high level. Um, I often, not because you are but the, the, um, I, the moderator, but I often say that Nigeria Health Watch comes closest to that, right? That, that the, fact, the fact that Nigeria Health Watch exists, um, as it's been for me, the best platform of which people are really talk about health is used in Nigeria in a way that one place can learn from the other. We, we, need, we need more such academic, but also blogs and similar things, but we, we do need that. If I was asking a, a donor to help me do something in Nigeria as a HPSR researcher, I will be demanding long-term support, commitments 20, 30 years to build this kind of intellectual infrastructure. Um, Excellent. A, a second, please. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> please, quickly, quickly, so we can round okay. up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because uh, I just wanted to add to that in the sense that um, the, uh, the question also asked about scale up, how evidence from one part of the country can be scaled up to right. other parts. Right. And I think that's also, um, that, 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 that's an anomaly in the sense that, um, like Cher had said uh, earlier and with the other questions, Nigeria is not one health system, it's 36 health systems, or even 37. And um, so, and, and, and often when we, we have seen several programs, I wouldn't have time to go into details, but where um, we pilot something in equity state and we say it works in equity state and we just want to cut and paste it in Borno state and it fails. So I think, um, yeah, we need to think about more of adaptation than scale up in the sense of the word. Contextualizing. Yeah, yeah contextualizing, yeah. Awesome, thank you so much. I, we have so many other incredible questions, but unfortunately we are out of time. Um, the next panel is set, is due to start um, soon in, at 11.45, and I do not want to eat into their time because I think it's a really interesting panel. Uh, it's been such an incredible, insightful conversation. I'm really privileged to have moderated this session. I want to say thank you to my incredible panelists. We will collate the questions and um, use them as part of our outputs from this convening. So thank you again to the panelists, Dr. Francis Ilika, um, Dr. Shaya Bimbola, Dr. Um, HMI Ebureme for your insightful and thought-provoking comments. I'd like to thank everyone who asked questions. Um, who, who put comments, who contributed. It's been such a rich discussion. And please stay on for the next um, panel because it's going to be really engaging. Um, I think that as we have learned from this panel, it's really important to continue to fight to reduce health inequities wherever we find them as HPSR practitioners. And because it's important for us to bequeath a more equitable, healthier world to our children and their children. Thank you again for giving me this opportunity and thank you to the conveners of this um, HSG Abuja 2020 convening. I would like to now hand back over to Dr. Badejo, who will do his closing remarks and introduce the next session. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Dr. Badejo, back to you. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Um, Dr. Kiki is not available to join at the moment. 
um, thank you for participating in this session. And like um, Ada has said, the next session starts at 11.45. So you're welcome to stay on the line if you're interested in the next session. Thank you so much for the participation. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to session B, 1B. I see that um, the panelists are here. I think we're waiting for just one of the panelists to arrive. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. thank you very much for Morning, joining. Everybody, and welcome to session 1B. So, I'm, my name is Kasaya Chiomitio, and I'm honored on behalf of HSG Africa Regional Network and the Systems Development Initiative to welcome you again to this event. 
um, for the sake of those that are just joining, I'll just briefly say that the theme for this convening is strengthening capacities for HPSR leadership in Nigeria. And it aims to address the gaps in HPSR generally in the country by identifying gaps, opportunities, advocacy strategies and tools for increasing participatory leadership for HPSR at national and subnational levels. We hope that our discourse today involving carefully selected public health participants in government, private and academic sectors and the media will contribute towards bridging the HPSR gaps. I'll um, introduce the um, panelists we have today. Our lead panelist is Dr. Chidaba Wonodi. She's a public health physician with over 28 years experience in projects in Africa, Asia, and America. She is currently the country director for John Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center, IVAC, Nigeria, and works between Abuja and Baltimore, conducting research and working to improve immunization service delivery and primary healthcare systems. She's also the principal investigator for a Gates funded project to evaluate the use of SMS messaging to improve immunization uptake in Northern Nigeria. In addition, she's the immunization team lead for the USAID funded Momentum Country and Global Leadership Project that aims at improving maternal, reproductive, newborn and child health and voluntary family planning through global policy advice and targeted technical assistance. And she's also the founder and convener of the Women Advocates for Vaccine Access, WAVA, a coalition of civil society organizations in Nigeria that advocate for increased uptake of vaccines and sustainable financing of immunization programs. Our next panelist is Professor Benjamin Uzochuku. He's a consultant community medicine physician and a professor of public health health policy and systems in the Department of Community Medicine and Health Administration and Management of the University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital, Enugu. He's also a fellow of the West African College of Physicians with over 20 years in public health. He has served as the assistant coordinator of the Health Policy Research Group, the deputy chairman, Epidemiological Society of Nigeria, EPISON, and then the first national auditor of the Association of Public Health Physicians of Nigeria, APHPN. He's a founding member of the Association of Schools of Public Health in, Afri in Africa, and he has years of experience. He has been known to focus on the effect of health sector reform processes on utilization of primary health care, the impact of user fees on household exemption policies in Nigeria, generation of new knowledge on strengthening health system policies um, amidst others. Our next panelist is Dr. Rukewe Ugumba. Dr. Ruki Ugumba is a family physician and an associate professor in family medicine at the University of Saskatchewan College of Medicine, Canada, with special interest in public health and infectious disease. She was the consultant to the Senate Committee on Health from December 2015 to May 2019. She was special advisor to the governor of Delta State on health monitoring from 2011 to 2015. She's an examiner for the College of Family Physicians of Canada and the Medical Council of Canada. She's the founder and president of Jesu Marie Empowerment Foundation, a Nigerian based NGO intervening in health education and skills acquisition mainly at the grassroots level. And our last but not least um, panelist is Dr. Meju Adeniro. Adeniro. She's a seasoned public health physician with over 15 years of experience in public health program design and management. For several years, she has worked as a consultant to non-governmental, private and public sector organizations in the areas of health system strengthening focused on local lessons and solutions to universal health coverage. She's skilled in policy evaluation and analysis for health systems research and science to table knowledge translation for program implementation. She has served as a lead program specialist, Hospital Assist Nigeria, a public health consultancy firm 
interested in health system strengthening and development. She leads SRH service delivery at the Initiative for Equal Rights and also is a founder and national co-chair of the Women in Global Health Nigeria, where she leads initiatives and advocacy for gender parity in global healthcare leadership in Nigeria. Her career is aimed at ensuring that low to middle income countries contribute significantly to global health. With this, I welcome you all to session 1B, which is the role of gender in advancing health systems and policy research in Nigeria. Welcome and over to you, Dr. Tudeba. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kasarachi, for the kind introductions. Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome my esteemed panel to this discussion where we're going to look at the intersection between health policy research in Nigeria and gender. To set the stage, I would like to um, establish some conceptual clarity because when we say gender, gender can mean many things to different people. But to anchor our discussion on a shared set of um, understanding, I will start off by saying that we all know that there is a difference between sex and gender. Sex is the classification of people as either male or female. But when we talk about gender, we are referring to a social construct. It, it also talks about the economic, social, political, and cultural attributes and opportunities associated with being either a woman or a man. So if you extrapolate that to the intersection with um, health systems, we could ask ourselves, how does being a man or a woman affect an individual's ability to influence health systems or health policies in terms of research, in terms of leadership, and so on and so forth? If you think about leadership of the health sector, we've had about 10 ministers of health in Nigeria over time. Out of those 10, only one um, was a woman. So what is the intersection between gender and health policy and health research? A way to understand that is what we call gender analysis. And that is a systematic way of examining differences in role and norms for men and women. So if you want to examine perhaps why the health system is not uh, functioning optimally, one approach you could use is to put a gender lens on it and do a gender analysis. And so my panel, my distinguished esteemed panel this morning will dig into all that discussion. Um, another concept that I want us to get clear and have a common understanding is, has to do with gender equity. So what do we mean by gender equity? Um, Gender equity is the process of being fair to men and women. Note that when we talk about gender, we're not just talking about women, it's also about men. And what measures are taken to ensure that fairness and what measures are taken to compensate for either historical or social disadvantages that have been um, um, associated with being a man or a woman and um, how we establish a level playing field for both men and women. So we're going to discuss that with um, reference to health systems in Nigeria. Um, when it comes to programming, um, we, also would, we also like to make a distinction around um, different approaches to address gender inequities. We, we hear about gender integration we hear about gender, um, gender norms, gender rules, and gender transformation or transformative gender approaches. So I'll just focus on integration and, and transformative gender approaches. Previously, a lot of focus had really been around integrating gender into programming. So there, are, there were things like um, gender frameworks or gender checklists so that when you're designing a program you ask yourself certain questions around um, to make sure that you're taking account of all the gender dimensions and that you know 
refers to design, implementation, and evaluation to take account of gender norms. So for example, if we knew that um, um, having clinic sessions in the morning would affect women's ability to um, attend these sessions because they are taking care of children at the same time, getting them ready for school, we could, as programmers, we could shift the session to the afternoon or evening to account for the woman's inability to come because of the other gender rules that are preventing her to attend um, our program. But we, we are now talking about gender transformative approaches where we not only accommodate the gender barriers, but we work to change the gender norms. We work to shift the gender norms so that we are transforming the system as a whole. So having established that um, baseline, I would like to move on to my panelists right now and starting with Prof. Um, Prof, you are a professor of many years and you've done quite a lot of research in health systems as well as in gender. Can you tell us why gender matters in health policy in your experience? Um, okay, so thank you Chizoba for that uh, introduction. Um, of course, uh, we do know that uh, gender-related stereotypes, uh, gender profiling, and the inequalities between men and women reduce the impact of public health programs. So that is an established fact. Um, we also know that uh, gender is a key social stratifier so as a power relation, it affects vulnerability to ill health and the decision-making space, as well as the economic power that people have to tackle illness. Um, access to services can be affected by gender. For example, uh, women may have less money to pay for healthcare and find it difficult to travel to healthcare facilities. On the other hand, sometimes the healthcare facilities can be too tailored to women, which now puts men off, you know, attending, for example, men not allowed to be in labor rooms when their wives are delivering. In Nigeria, for example, many women are excluded from making decisions that are related to their family's health and from assessing health services in their communities. Of course, these exclusions are due to patriarchal norms, which are often exhibited by things like Puda. Puda, you know, is a religious and social practice that requires women to cover most parts of their bodies and avoid areas frequented by men. So in many communities, especially in the North, uh, such forbidden areas include health facilities and public meeting places. This limits women's access to medical care and uh, community activities. Uh, these social dynamics can actually impact on the quality and effectiveness of community engagement of public health programs, which is very, very important in advancing health policy and systems in Nigeria. And of course, we know that uh, women's participation in community programs facilitates more broad-based and lasting outcomes when you compare it with those that are designed solely by male community uh, leaders. Um, we also know that uh, here in Nigeria, discrimination is even worse for girls living in conflict affected areas like Northeast Nigeria. Uh, some of these girls are forced into early marriages by their parents as a means of economic survival and protection. And we know the consequences of this, you know, BVF, 
you know, depression and all that. Uh, women and men also use healthcare differently with women consulting more often than men, especially when it comes to primary health care. Then most recently, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has also raised issues of you know, gender and health systems. Uh, by now, you probably are aware of the gendered nature of this COVID-19. Every day, there are news articles about how more men are dying than women, or how the social and economic damage of COVID-19 will hurt women more than men. You know, the instruction or orders to uh, engage in social isolation and stay at home are putting women at increased risk of domestic violence. Meanwhile, there has been little discussion on the impact of COVID-19 on gender minorities. And that brings, that reminds me of what uh, Chizoba just said about uh, gender. You know, when I was logging in into this program, I was asked to answer some questions. I saw male, <laughs> saw female, and then the third one was, if you don't want to answer. <laughs> so what happens to those who are transgender? So what happens to those who are neither male nor female, you know, uh, uh, primarily? So you see, these are the gender minorities and they're not being taken care of in some of these uh, programs. So health policy and systems is very, very important. So to strengthen the health systems, we need to pay particular attention to gender. So, Prof, very, very, I, yes. think, I think you raise a very interesting point in, in the sense that I think some of the things I take away from what you um, eloquently said is that gender definitely um, increases vulnerability, reduces um, access. There is evidence that it reduces women's access to health care. But you've also talked about the fact that um, we may have leaned a bit too backwards towards um, women in the design of primary health care programs that men feel um, uncomfortable being in the health, in the primary health care settings. Yeah. And that um, we should not, not only look at women, but also at men. And we should all, not only look at the gender majority, but the gender minority, the transgender. Yeah. I want to come to Dr. Ruki. Um, Dr. Ruki, what's your take on this, this issue? It's, it's very interesting. I was just listening to Prof. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's pretty early morning here, as you know. Um, so I'm a real early bird this morning. Um, Prof, Prof has just um, nailed it. In fact, your introduction was brilliant. Um, the truth is, um, gender inequality is, is a really big issue in Nigeria. Uh, we know that um, for most parts, especially in the northern Nigeria, women don't really have a voice. And even in the East, we just had a landmark ruling where um, they said women can actually inherit property in the East. I believe you're from the East um, and she's about, this was the um, uh, Supreme Court ruling. In general, women do not get their fair share at, in the table. And of course, when you want to talk about transgender, then that's a whole different thing. The bottom line is we know that the health of a woman will bring the health of a nation because first of all, women are the first mothers, teachers, and and they are the ones that actually do most of the raising of the society, especially the, the young children. And so going to health, we know that health is really important when there's education in the family. Well, we know that women's education is still very, very poor in, in most parts of Nigeria, where the boy child is still taken as a premium, even in all um, sections of Nigeria, even in the East, even in, in my side, I'm from Wari. And, um, you know, girls don't actually have the same voice where, you know, of course, there's um, different um, issues like, um, um, what's it called, um, polygamy and all that. And that reduces a woman's voice in the house, depends on what position she is. So, um, in general, my take is we have a long way to go in advancing health for women in Nigeria. We have a long way to go for this gender equality. Um, all over the world, you can see that women are leaders. Um, like, like you said, you just had one 
out of 10 women health ministers in Nigeria, where they're actually half the population of Nigeria, um, Nigerians are women. And even as we went to medical school, we saw the inequality in, in the gender bias as well with um, fewer females um, graduating as doctors then and even now. And so the education is, is a big problem. The, um, actually the qualified women getting the same share of the space is also a big problem. Then even down to the grassroots, um, women, you find they're probably the most hardworking of, of the of this lot, like I'm an honorable woman, and you can find their farmers and doing all the all the heavy lifting, yet they don't have a voice um, at home. So in it's a very, very, like you said, interesting, very topical topic to me, because as a physician, as you know, I, I was also running for the House of Reps in the last elections, and my own experience was really, really dire, where I, I saw not even my ticket even though I believe I was the most qualified, having been in government for, for the past 10 years, working so hard to bring um, health to Deltans and Nigerians. And after that, of course, I went to the Senate, I became a consultant, and um, that's a whole different ball game. I'm sure we can see all the things playing at the national level, what happens in National Assembly, and how um, bills are passed, and um, how those bills we're meant to be having an oversight function on how to regulate even what the bill that was passed for the healthcare to down to the people and there's lots of gaps in between where it's not even getting done. So, I mean, I could talk all day about um, the inequality in, in this gender bias um, for men in Nigeria, but um, I think I should right. just maybe stop here about this comment. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I, I'd like you to jump in here. Um, what, are, what are we seeing in terms of how women are positioned in um, places of power and authority where they can influence health policy research? What, what, are, the, what are the challenges that you're seeing? Right. So first of all, I'm extremely enthusiastic about us applying gender across all the units that make up the framework of the health system. And um, like Prof said, and like Dr. Ruki also said, none of these spaces are gender neutral. Service delivery is not gender neutral. Many of the spaces where we deliver um, healthcare is not gender neutral. When you go to a healthcare facility at the primary healthcare level, it certainly isn't. There are spaces where women are more comfortable to be in. There are spaces where men are more comfortable um, to not be in, which is which is a, a great point uh, because we don't want to do the reverse of what we're accusing people of. We don't want to make a space so um, feminine positive that um, the man doesn't feel like they want to. They, they don't want to come in. So service delivery is not gender neutral. The health workforce is not gender neutral. I can speak to that. There's a triangle um, where at the bottom, especially when, when the space of public health, at the bottom, the people carrying the, the public health system, which um, for me is the real health system. I, I don't know if, you know, I, nobody's going to stone me here. But who's carrying the healthcare system? The women. And this is not just because um, women are the ones delivering in, 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 I'm not just talking about the community health workers, but I'm talking about the community health workers need to key in to somebody. And I, I always talk about how we underemphasize the role of the woman as the implementer. She's a domestic implementer of all these policies. We can design all these policies so great, but you need a domestic partner to implement this with you. Who is helping you implement vaccinations? Who is ensuring the women and uh, the children get vaccinated? You can um, fortify um, salt with iodine all you want, but somebody has to make the purchase decision. Who goes to the market to say this, not that? You know, who is ensuring that the, uh, the children, the nutrition, that you design the nutrition policy, but your domestic implementer is the woman in the house. But we don't emphasize this enough. All right, so health information systems is not gender neutral. If we're talking about um, using um, the digital innovation to increase health information or health education, um, we have to talk about how it's not gender neutral. Are women able to have the same access as men um, to digital devices? Of course, access to essential medicines or um, financing is not gender neutral. But I want to talk about leadership and governance So, um, because my enthusiasm. Um, and I will circle back to um, when I say service delivery. And I'm going to link that to leadership and governance. Um, not um, putting our lens right on who is carrying the health system makes it easy to say the women are not participating. So my... An ideal world for me is to ensure that more women are in leadership and governance, but 
I think that the first start with us being honest, more honest as a system um, about who is actually doing the work, who is actually carrying the work. And if we say that um, uh, about 90 percent of what constitutes the healthcare system will be delivered through the public health system, through the relationship between the community health workers, which are more than 88% 80, female, and the domestic implementers, which are more than 90% female. So it's already a female-led, female-implemented system. But then you see, as you rise up um, through the ranks um, to leadership, the women begin to fall off. And then at the top of the pyramid is a testosterone um, festival. And then you now ask that if less women are in the room to lend their voices to how these policies are designed, how do we key in properly um, to the implementation level? If this is, uh, you know, uh, so, so that is something I'm applying um, my life's work to. How do we, um, first of all, draw attention to the fact that this space is not um, um, gender neutral? There is a big lack of gender equity. And first of all, if for no other reason, by cutting women out of leadership, we're using only half of our talent pool. How do you imagine how women are trained um, to do this work? Women are, in, are positioned um, to, to implement this system. And you know, somehow when we're garnering our talents, we're leaving out at least half. Of, and I'm saying at least, at least half of our talent pool is outside when we don't have more women in the positions of, of, of leadership. I can speak to a couple of policies that I can see that if a woman was in that room and had a voice in the design of this policy, um, you would see a differently crafted, differently implemented policy. And even when, I mean, the process of policy design and is ongoing, but here's the thing, when we implement a policy, we evaluate that policy. And when we evaluate the policy and we, we have to look at what's not working. So we, right. um, we rely on feedback coming from the evaluation and the field um, to be able to take in what's not working and then redesign and evaluate. Women not so, being in the room um, of the evaluation process, which is often at governance, is why very many policies are still failing and we allow them to fail. Right. That's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a powerful uh, proposition. And, and I like what you said about we have a testosterone festival at the top. And I want to add an, an estrogen feast at the bottom. Yes. However, um, the, 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 this, is, this is actually true. But if you look at northern Nigeria and you look at the primary health care system in northern Nigeria, you actually have more male health workers than female health workers, even at the grassroots level. And so the, the picture is not always the same. In the panel before, we're talking about in Nigeria, we have 37 health systems. So the, the, the fact that in many states in Northern Nigeria, the gender issue is really around not having enough female health workers who can provide services um, to women and who can like go to in, into the houses when they're doing outreaches and all that. that. That is the problem in many parts of Northern Nigeria. And you could say that in Southern Nigeria, it's the um, opposite case where you have mostly the women at the lower levels and then very few women at the top. So, so Prof, I, I wanna come to you. For many years, we've really recognized this issue of gender um, inequity, gender disparity, and the impact it's had on health outcomes as well as um, health policy. Have we made any progress at all? And if we have made any progress, what are these, what, what are these um, signs of encouraging uh, movement and um, what, what um, has brought them about? Uh, okay, uh, yeah, well, I think, yeah, I think we are making progress. Um, but what, what is important here is for me, again, is that, uh, and like uh, you know, uh, Peju said, and I think you also said that, that uh, gender is not just about women. So one key progress that is being made now is that uh, the issue of men are also coming on board. 
So people are beginning to understand that when you talk about gender inequity, it's not just about women. Men also have their problems, you know, especially within the context of uh, health policy and systems uh, research. And uh, of course, in the area of research, um, it's almost getting balanced now. Uh, concerted effort is being made to make sure that uh, both male and female are represented. And then in programs, in the uh, call for uh, proposals, you will see some efforts being made that each proposal sh should have gender mainstreaming, okay? Uh, so, so these are some of the efforts that I think are, are being made in, in, in that direction to cancel out the, the gender uh, inequity in health, especially in health policy and uh, systems uh, research. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Are we making- Very interesting. I was, I was listening to Prof and I was thinking, Prof, are you speaking for men because you're a man? You know, and it was very interesting. I almost interrupted you there. But it's, it's really true that um, we are making some progress, but it's, I don't think it's, it's far enough at all. Um, even in, in all aspects, uh, like, like Pedro said, it's a pyramid and women are at the bottom. And we have equal numbers of men and women in demographics in Nigeria. So I think the policy should actually make good um, space for women. So every um, implementation for any, I would say, any um, laws or any um, appointments or any organization, you need to create um, conscious divide for men and women. Otherwise, you will not have women leading at all. Now, um, in Nigeria today, as you know, um, the leadership is, is filled with men. You know, I'm talking, there's no state governor, there's a female, most um, even in the cabinet at all the, from the federal government to the state government to local government, you see men. And so when you don't have women at the table making decisions, you're going to have policy um, bias towards men as well. And so, so for me, I would like to see, first of all, our budget is not properly Im implemented at all. We have every year, we have this huge foray about annual budgets. People come defend your budget. The budget is not released less, less than 50% most of the time across all the state institutions. And even that budget does not reflect, like you said, the needs for women. And even at that, again, who's implementing those budgets? So again, the monitoring aspect of uh, implementation needs to also see women at the table. So, so we haven't come far enough. Um, like I said, Nigeria, we're still operating, we're meant to operate 1% of the consolidated annual revenue on, on, um, on health. And we haven't seen that at all. It hasn't reached 1%, even when it said it will reach 1% ever since um, over um, 10 years ago with Good Lord Jonathan as the president, that's when that law was made. And still, even with this pandemic, we, see, we saw a health budget slash. And so how are you going to implement anything without money? We know that, first of all, you have to have the right policy. Second of all, then you have to have the budget to implement the policies. So for me, um, Nigeria, we are very, very far um, from where we need to be. Um, I know that um, there's a conscious effort to, to have this discussion, and I really appreciate this panel, um, HSG, talking about um, gender equality and bringing women on board, especially, like you said, there's even transgender now all over the world, even though I know it's still a crime to say that um, I mean, that's a different topic for, for another day. But Nigerians don't accept, and the laws don't accept transgender and actually homosexuality and all these things are issues because it not only affects men, it affects women. And if you're not happy, and if you're not able to express yourself, you cannot even do your job. So there's a lot of problem in this space. And I know that we have many, many policies to make and the ones that we already have are not even properly implemented. I think I'll stop here. Thanks very much. So um, I like where this conversation is going. I think we've established that gender is really important in um, promoting health and health systems and health policy. We've also established that we've made some progress, a little bit of progress, but we still have a long way to go. So, Pedro, I want to turn to you now to ask, 
what are the instruments? We know that there's still a lot of challenge, right? What are the instruments that we can put in place to make sure that we are systematically addressing the gender barriers that women face in rising from the bottom to the top that perhaps men face in being um, accepted as part of the, the, the caregiver um, environment. Because in some, in some places, if you, if, you find, if you find a man carrying a child in the back with a the wrapper, they will say it's, a, it's an abomination. So men are actually actively discouraged from taking part in nurturing and caring for their children and things like that. What kinds of um, mechanisms or policies or instruments can we put in place to begin to address this at different levels? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I was eager to jump in about where we are, but I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that. I, I so wanted to be ambitious and enthusiastic and hopeful and follow in Prof's light. Um, but I, I have, um, I, and in the discussion, we will go on to where we are and where we need to be. But then, you know, solutions. Now, um, I was thinking about this really um, strongly before coming to this um, before coming to this panel. And I realized that um, what I bring to this, to this place is the um, ability to be persistent about asking questions, even when I don't have the answers. So um, I, don't, I don't think that not knowing what it looks like clearly should stop any of us from asking those questions persistently and strategically. So I have a few um, um, uh, re responses. And, and the thing is, what can we apply? What, what we can apply um, differs contextually. And honestly, because we have such a very, um, the tapestry of where our culture intersects with our, our social um, um, class and the fact that this is also a health system that was colonized and is trying to decolonize itself and yet also in partnership with the system that colonized it, it's, it's very, very compl complicated. Uh, but the one thing that I think will help is for us to do exactly what we're doing here. How do we apply learnings and research, how do we find ways to actually research questions, which is continue to ask, continue to ask, continue to review, continue to review. Um, how, when we say, and, and you know, it's, it's funny because um, somebody said this in the chat. Um, I am concerned that um, if you say, for instance, men are not in the space, men are, for instance, delivering a lot of healthcare um, services in the North. This is true. But this is because it, that space has been gendered out. So that even when you have the beneficiaries being um, maternal and childcare, it's a, it's a position that men don't think women should aspire to. And you know, in the North, they traditionally keep women at home and away from education. So it is not because um, women are not encouraged to want to be in these spaces. They are already encouraged to be in these spaces. We know that women were already um, giving uh, uh, health services in their own traditional structure. Women were already helping other women with giving birth. They were helping them take care of children. So it would, make, it would have made the entire sense that when we were ready to structure um, community health, we would already build on this system. But what happened? Um, the health worker position was something that um, it's, it's a position of prestige in that community. And immediately what happened, the woman was written out and the men in. And then mm -hmm. let's look at the effects. When the men are delivering healthcare and um, you know, how many, and how many women are willing to undress in front of a male health worker? And if she, even if she's willing to undress, the irony is even her husband who won't let her um, uh, become a health worker does not want her to be examined by a male health worker. So we have this huge stalemate. Um, so, and um, so when we talk about, I want to talk about something that I want us to critically access. And that, however, ho however long we've gone, we have a huge glaring, for instance, pay gap. How did we get to the pay gap? It's something I mentioned earlier, which is the work of women is always underemphasized most of the work of the women in carrying the health system is still regarded as voluntary. I'm a physician. 
In the triangle of things, I'm structurally male because I'm top of the pyramid. And when I see a child in my clinic, I've seen this child, this child is 12 years old and I'm here as the doctor on top of that pyramid. And you know, it worked out for me, but I'm here on top of that pyramid. But what the system encouraged me to do was to ignore the fact that somebody immunized that child. It's a community health worker who's never going to be able to get the kind of um, remuneration that I've gotten in my life. And when we're pushing for health worker pay, of course the physician gets first. We want more money for doctors. We want more money for, because the assumption is I'm the structural male at the top. And you know, I, I like to say this to all physicians. Female physicians in Nigeria, you are structurally male until we begin to apply ourselves to the bottom of the triangle and, and continue to advocate for women at the bottom of the triangle. It, it's, it's fine, it, it works out for you when you're at the top of the triangle with all your privilege and all of that. So we have to take off that privilege that is structurally male and then turn it on its head and begin to say, emphasize the work of the women at the bottom of the triangle. Begin to advocate for the women that are carrying this health system that you're sitting on top of. Do not make community health work voluntary work. Pay properly, emphasize properly, put the lens on their work properly, and then put their, their, their income, their contribution, their training, put it bang in the middle of the health system. This is public health. I'm not as qualified as a community health worker to speak. How many voices, how do we advocate to have their voices in the room? They should teach me. So right. moving right. the frame and applying the research um, questions to how do we prioritize, right? How do we reimagine? How do we reimagine this triangle? It's something I'm, I'm, I'm applying my, 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 it's my present life's work, and you can see I'm extremely enthusiastic about it. Reimagining yeah. that pyramid and putting our frame right and beginning to become uncomfortable with your privilege. I'm a structural male in this triangle, and I am presently uncomfortable with that. And I invite everyone to become uncomfortable with being at that peak. That's absolutely excellent, uh, Dr. Teju. Um, it's, it's critical to, to recognize the privileges that we have, um, especially as uh, physicians, and recognize that without the health workers, the mass of health workers at the bottom, we, we cannot get the health system to be what it needs to be for the people. Um, I, I like the issue that you brought up, the pay gap which essentially means that men get more pay for the same work uh, that women do. So that needs to really be highlighted. And then I also want to bring up the issue of why is, why is there a um, testosterone fest at, at the lower level in, in Northern Nigeria? And that's because women are not, they, 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 they don't go to school. They are educationally disadvantaged. So if we're going to address the gender issues, it cannot, the solution does not just lie in the health, health space. We have to also do some um, intersectoral work. We have to work in education as well. Excellent. Dr. Um, Prof, I'm, I'm back to you again. What are your thoughts on how we can begin to move the needle on gender in, um, inequities in Nigeria and in health policy space? Uh, okay, well, um, and, and to make this question more specific to you, because I would want people to think about in their sphere of in influence, where in the places that you have a uh, control over, we want to make it more practical. If, for example, you were made the VC of um, UNN um, tomorrow, what would you do? How would you move the needle? Okay. Uh, I will come to that uh, later. But let me just say that um, in terms of health policy and systems research, which I think is the focus of this webinar, which is gender and health policy and systems. Uh, and of course, that is an area which I also work in. I, I think that you know, to strengthen the health systems, we need to pay particular attention to gender. Okay, so it is very important that we understand how health systems components interact with each other and how gender plays a role in each of these uh, uh, 
uh, sub uh, systems, okay, and then how we can now address the gender issues that come up in health systems strengthening activities so that we can improve the health and social outcomes of our people. Okay, if we include gender analysis in health systems research, this of course helps the effectiveness of programs and it will lead to better research recommendations and more strategic interventions that will deal with the problem, okay? And then as health systems researchers also, we need to recognize gender issues, okay? So we need to be very conscious of this if we want to move uh, forward with uh, 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 gender and health system. We need to first of all recognize it, that it's important and all that. Now, specifically, if you've asked the question of, uh, if I'm made a vice chancellor, okay, what will I do to uh, advance gender issues? Um, the first thing I think I should do will be to develop the gender mainstreaming strategy with clear objectives, okay, uh, that will identify gender considerations as being cross-cutting and of course non-negotiable. Um, again, I address gender as not just women issues. I want to address gender as both women problems and men problems and those who have now said they are neither of the two. So I believe that such a strategy should include uh, issues around gender mainstreaming as part of the policies and programs of the university, okay? Um, that will include things like training, which is backed by financial and human resources, okay? Um, although an interesting number of women have entered academics, as have been raised here, yet there are few in higher ranks. In my faculty, for example, in fact, my college, for example, I cannot remember when a female was the dean of medical sciences. Whoa. I cannot wow. remember when a female was provost of the medical sciences. So for me, as a vice chancellor, I will try to identify champions on gender issues who can actually communicate in a gender sensitive manner. Try to promote gender balance and diversity, okay? And then ensure that women and men equally have the same opportunities to advance in their career and be promoted to higher positions. For example, sponsoring them, you know, for capacity development, conferences, and all that. It's also important that we put measures in place, gender specific measures in place, like uh, mentorship programs to advance uh, the capacity of both men and of course women. And then of course, I should be in a position to address what Ruki said. That is, we challenge the discriminatory practices to avoid the testosterone festival at the top. <laughs> so making conscious effort that we produce, for example, a female dean or, for example, a female provost. Just mm -hmm. most recently, the first female provost was elected into office in the University of Ibado, despite okay. its long-standing... So, so we will make conscious efforts to make sure that women come on, on, on board, okay? So, so we, we need to look beyond the individual, okay? We need to look beyond the individual and then look at the organization as a whole. If there are conscious efforts to bring certain gender down, then we'll make conscious efforts to bring them up. So that will be my approach to gender and uh, academia, you know, if you let the vice chancellor. Thank you very much. Prof, excellent. You have my vote for the next VC of the uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure God is hearing. Um, I, 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 yes, I, I hope Rookie is happy now. I'm very happy, Prof. I'm happier now. So, Rookie, Rookie, um, yes. Rookie, you were the first female um, National Assembly aspirant in your local government area. 
and um, 2023 is around the corner and I'm yeah. sure you're going to throw your hat in the ring as well. If you became a, a, a parliamentarian, what would you do to advance the gender agenda in um, health systems and policy? First of all, let me just say what Prof said. I'm very happy with what he said. As he said, he knows I'm very happy now. But the truth is, I think they just made an acting VC, um, University of Lagos, and she's a female, correct? This is just a yes. few days old. Yes. So I'm very happy that the University of Lagos is one of the big ones. And a woman is in that space. So that makes me very excited. So what am I going to do? First of all, it's very, very clear that, as Prof said, mainstreaming of this gender bias needs to be addressed and policies need to come in place. You need to create quotas for women. There's no other way we can get into this space. We're financially disadvantaged. Um, we, do not, we do not have the political will. We do not have, um, like you said, um, even the internal party um, um, structure. You know, you're talking about me running now again in 2023. I'm, I'm sure you know what happened in 2019. I was the I first know. woman to, uh, to collect um, a ticket to run for House of Reps in my local government, yet um, I think I was most qualified, you know, by all by all accounts. Yet a relatively unknown is actually in the space right now, and I ran in the APC party, which is the opposition party in Delta State. And even though APC is at the at the federal government um, level, we didn't get the support that we needed. I don't want to tell you the cost of it. So first of all, people ask you. Oh, what happened to your marriage? Is that, you, that to do with you being a woman? Being a woman. First of all, why are you not married? And why are you not in your husband's house? Why are you trying to run for politics? You know, these people that run do not have good relationships, things like that. They discourage you. They talk about religion. They talk about your, your um, being in a man's space and being um, like, you know, maybe you're going to, they're going to be a predator against you so you don't have a brain to think for yourself. And, it, and of course, like you said, the actual structure of having night meetings and all those things are very disadvantaged, yeah. very dangerous for women because yeah. you, you, know, you have to have security and things like that. If you don't really have the will to, to do this um, political, um, um, what's it called, journey, you can't do it. It's very difficult. They make things very difficult for you. So if you start with the party from the party creating spaces for women, saying that out of all these positions, we want even party officials, these are women, not just woman leader, you understand? Mm -hmm. Out of 40, uh, out of 10 positions, four out of 10 should be for women, things like that. So the most qualified women can enter that space. That's one. Now, when you have women advocating for women, you will have more women um, and showing up in those positions. That's the first thing. Second thing is the financial imbalance. As you said, women are less paid all across the board for all the work they do. How do we get equal pay for equal work? We're not saying pay us more, but just pay us our fair share. And so this is a very big problem, again, financial. What kind of, what kind of legislative instruments can you use to address that financial imbalance? Very, very interesting. Very important. So, in the legislature, you have to create quotas for women. So if you create quotas for women and make sure that there's no gender bias to pay. So everyone who gets this job will get the same pay. Yeah, so the packages are identical regardless of your sex. That can be legislated so that if you aspire to this position, this is what you get and this is how you will get, um, including all your, what's it called, bonuses, benefits and all those things that come with the job. That's, that's the second thing. So that's really important. For me, the third thing that's really, really important is getting very transparent processes. Now, even we, I was on the advocate the other day, I'm sure that's where you saw me, she's about to invite me. There was a talk about women and they said, even when you now create quotas for women, the worst of the lot will show up because they have either bottom power or some kind of power, which I think it also needs to be addressed. The women who are qualified to actually stay in that space should be the ones that occupy that space, not the worst of us, if you know what I mean. So we need to make the process very transparent so that women who actually want the job, aspire to the job, can actually get it. That's the other thing we need to do. The fourth thing I think we need to do is actually create a very um, clear timetable for when things to be done. Sometimes the fatigue of the process makes you drop off. 
you understand? So, for example, we started in a primary at 8 o'clock in the morning. And deliberately, they prolong it to 4 a.m. So that you are, you know, so you can imagine a, menstru a menstruating female, for example, because we have biology that actually disadvantages us to, to certain things that men can do. And even, you know, just simple things like sanitary facilities. A man can just go behind the door and do whatever he needs to do. Whereas the woman can't do that. Especially if you wear, you know, a nice two double wrapper, like, you know, how you need to dress right. up sometimes. So all these things, we need to create, you know, that environment where a woman can feel comfortable to do exactly what she needs to do. And women are brave. Women are intelligent. Women are actually very resilient and we can adapt. But you see, they create all these little bottlenecks to make you, to push you out of the space. So like right. I said, I'm going to run in 2023. I'm going to shine my eye, according to how we say it in worry. You understand? I'm not going to let anybody who drinks me, you know? The truth is, the, pe the people that we are trying to represent are also the problem. You understand? Educating them to know that just the share, 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 bag of rice, recharge card, is, is once in four years. They'll come and do this, and you never see them again. You know, Ruki, you raise, you raise an important point in the sense that the people that we're, we're advocating for also do add a problem to what yeah. extent is the common woman on the street the community level woman to what extent is she aware of these gender issues and actually fighting for gender equality or does she accept it as that's our culture that's my destiny what to the to the woman in this on the street is gender inequality equal to her destiny Peju, can you come in here briefly and then we will go to the, um, the questions we have in the chat. Yes. Oh, so first of all, I'd, I'd like to say that, you know, I was nodding very vigorously. <laughs> to, first of all, I no longer believe that um, structural barriers are unintentional or that they are, um, what's the word, or just a happy accident. Um, I'm no longer naive to think that somebody just puts political meetings in the middle of the night because, you know, that's when we finished. I no longer believe that. When I was younger, I thought, oh, these are just accidents. They're just coincidences. Um, um, I am, what's the word, woke to the ways in which we either design or allow these structural barriers to women um, in politics, for instance. It's not, it's no, um, it's, 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 it's a no-brainer. So and I would enjoin everyone to walk in also with that sense of almost aggression at looking at those structural barriers. Because if you think they just happened and people were not trying to kind of at least perpetuate, um, then I, I think we're wrong. Um, so what are the barriers to, to, because we are already at the community level, women already organize. And then when they, we go up, they sort of like, Draw. There are reasons where, where, why women are not encouraged to have their own money. Um, and it's, it's true. There are reasons why we're hearing a lot of submission, submission, and this is how to be virtuous. You know, there are reasons why. The context, even that time, um, I, and I don't want to get into the, the, the difficult area of religion, but if you look at some of the teaching across all religions at the time, when women start becoming difficult to a, to, to a social um, situation, then we're reminded how we should be at home taking care of the children. And then we're reminded how being at home taking care of, of children is not a hard policy. And I'm going to say there is no soft policy or hard policy. And they're going to try and tell us, oh, SRH, um, female feeding the child. Feeding the child is a development issue. Breastfeeding the child is a global development issue. So I'm going to go and follow Dr. Ruki into the house and go with our breasts and say, this is why we want six months to breastfeed. And you're not going to make me feel ashamed of something that my body can do. And they will say, why do women, you see these women now, then she will get pregnant and this, but the global health security rests on breastfed children. And yet you want to put my breastfeeding issues, the global development work that I'm doing at the back burner and say, oh, you know what, let's talk about a bridge. No, we, we talk about the bridge in the same um, document as we talk about menstrual health and wash. 
and you're going to give me water because my children need to be able to not have diarrhea and all, because they're your children too. Because in 15 years time, that's your human capital. Exactly. So do not make me feel like the work that I'm doing is a soft mm -hmm. policy issue. So be honest about what I'm contributing. So um, how do we apply, first of all, like Dr. Ruki said, first of all is legislation. We must inorganically um, legislate and say this quota is for women. And I know sometimes you can say it's a tokenism, but you know what, we'll take it, we start from there. And then we take the tokenism, and then the next thing is that we continue to build the right signals. More women get into the space. And yes, you will first find the worst of the women, um, worst of the women leadership. And when I say testosterone, women too are capable of participating in testosterone festival. Let me say this, it's not just men. It is, for me, it, the testosterone sign signals um, a pyramid. And wherever you can see a pyramid, that is what I call the testosterone ha um, um, happening. So women too can be guilty of entering that space and making it difficult for other women to come in. Women are patriarchy soldiers as well. We're, and we do women it exactly like well. So fast, a lot. Yeah, a lot of we do it right. so well. Right. And we do it in the most subtle way. So we are- Do we, we vote for ourselves when we are, when we're on the ticket? We yes. absolutely vote Kilo, for ourselves. I'll vote for you. For we sure. absolutely vote for ourselves. I have no problems. And not just women. I'm, I'm not talking now. And I, I want to say something that Prof said. Men, women, and those who identify as neither. Because how do you remove a disadvantage? I am never ashamed of nepotism that is correcting a disadvantage. That's not nepotism. There's another word for it. And they're going to come with you, come with the nepotism angle and say, is it just because she's a woman? Well, yes. And it has to be that way for now because we are reversing a trend. When we are comfortable enough for the gender not to matter, then I will not vote for a woman. But that hasn't happened, probably won't happen in even my lifetime. So right now, we, we do nepotism along the gender lines and then we have a balance. And then one day, and we will know. We will know, for instance, and I say this, I say this to my children, how will I know? We will know the day a woman gets six months to breastfeed. We will, when that happens, you will look around and you will see that it's finally coming together. Because I, I, um, the breastfeeding policy is a simple example of how a woman is forced to make a choice between life and career. And we've been sitting down for 50 years, we've tried to prioritize breastfeeding. And I like to use this example a lot. We tried to prioritize breastfeeding at the global level, more than 50 years. And even at the, in the global north, we are still looking at a three months maternity leave. Pedro, are you and saying what, that all women should get to six months maternity leave because that's not feasible? I would no, rather I'm say there should be a daycare in the workplace where she can go and breastfeed no, the child. that's exactly what I'm saying. Thinks, yes. First of all, I'm saying that we must recognize a gap that nobody is speaking about. First okay, of all, I see what you recognize mean. the right. fact that there's a problem. I thought you wanted six months maternity leave for all women. I thought that's I, what you were saying. That's so, so I, I'm getting there. So here's the thing, we, have, we want six months to breastfeed. We say we want a child to be exclusively breastfed for six months. And then we're giving yeah. three months. And I want, if a woman was in that room, she would first of all say, hold up, there's three months missing. Then we would start a conversation, oh, there's three months missing, how do we fix the three months? What I'm hearing is radio silence. So oh, Peju, right, Peju, I think, we, we, we have to be realistic, like Rookie is pointing right. out, right? Then what is, the, what is the policy? What can we do after the three months? One is to create an environment where women are allowed to bring their children to work and breastfeed, right? Yes. When I had my babies as, yeah. as a practicing cl cl uh, clinician, I used to take my children to work to, exactly. so that I could, I could walk the talk when I'm telling people to breastfeed exclusively for, for six months. So, but this is so interesting, but we, we are running out of time and I want the, um, I want the audience to have um, an opportunity um, to, to ask questions. So I'm gonna look in the chat and see um, if there are any other comments that um, you guys should address. Um, okay. So people are accepting that crashes in the workplace are important. Um, people are saying that yes, they will vote for women who are qualified. So, rookie, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, what else is there? Need space for breastfeeding. 
Okay, okay. So I, I don't see any particular question here. It's just people responding positively to all the panelists have said. Um, and that's excellent. So I, I, yeah, wanna, uh, I want to... Chisoba, Chisoba, sorry. Yes, sorry, please. there's a particular comment here which I find very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually right. from one of my colleagues who work in gender. And she said that enlightened women need to engage in massive sensitization of other women in Absolutely. lower economic positions. They needed changes. I think this is very, very important. You, they need to sensitize those who are less privileged, okay? They need to bring themselves on board. A situation where if a presidential candidate was a female, and all the no female delegate voted for that presidential candidate is is something exactly. to think about. Thank you very much. Prof, let me jump in there. You know, in the in the first election, the 2014 election, there was just one woman um, running for president. I'm sure we remember that. And then this 2019 and election, she got only one vote. She only, only got one vote. vote. She voted for herself. And, her, and that was her vote. Yes. That's, that's completely and then, even, her female, know, P, even her female PA did not vote for her. You talk about mentorship in that space, you know. We need women who have been successful in the political, spa political space to mentor upcoming politicians so that they can tell them how did they do it, how did they succeed, workshops, programs, and even funding, even if it's GoFundMe. Because like I said, the money is okay. a very big bottleneck. They told me to pay 3 million naira for my form, to pick up my form, to run as a primary, not even the main election, just to get endorsed. How many women okay. have 3 million naira to come to that uh, political space, for example? Right. So how do you Ruby. jump those barriers? Mentorship Hello? and support. Okay, so overall, at the end of the day, I, I, I really yeah, endorse what Prof says, women bringing up women. Oh women leading women, men leading women. Men can also mentor women, you understand? So Thank not just uh, this gender I inequality. Think, I think I'll cut it off here with the panelists so that the, um, if you go to the Q&A, we have some questions there. Um, let me start from, let me start from, how do we address gender inequality observed at the leadership level in national? What factors contributed this and how do we address this over a long period? Um, let's see. Can you, can you guys see the question and answer? No, That's, I can't. No, you can't. I yeah. can. You can? Yes. Okay, can you take, um, can you take one of the questions? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to I'm take briefly, the question. I'm briefly too, because we have I'm briefly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let me see well, where gonna, the question is. So I see in the chat, where is it? Yes, it's the Q&A to the, to the right. It's the Q&A. It's different okay. from the chat. So um, yes, I want to address, how do we address the gender in, in inequality observed at the leadership level? And we've mentioned it several times, but I think we want to be more. First of all, we have to prepare more younger women for leadership roles. And um, that is um, um, ensuring that um, women, the signals are right. We see women leading, women in positions of authority. I, before I die, I want to at least see a female health minister before I die. Uh, more importantly, before I die, I would like to see women who work on the community level being paid and being paid well. Because I think that one is certainly related to the other. So women can aspire for career, and when within this um, um, health delivery, women can aspire for career advancement. And I would even love for a female health minister to not necessarily come from a woman that looks like me, who is privileged and speaks the English and all of that. I want more women who do not look like me to be in the room because they are the ones that, so how do we, so I want us to intentionally prepare younger women. So when we look at from the, let's look for the, for the academic programs, like Prof said, how do we, do we deliberately in, in, insist that these programs are gender friendly to women a, a, throughout the her life course? Because a woman, um, the gender of a woman is affected by reproduction, is a big part of her life course. 
and like I said, I do not agree that they will allow us to, they would, um, we, we, the system will, will call it a soft policy or call it a soft issue and have you to hide. I, um, okay. so I, I, I do not have to remove my estrogen to earn my place in the room, right? Okay. So, um, so Dr. Dr. Program, Dr. yes. So I hear you very well. Prepare younger women. Prepare definitely. younger women, definitely. So we have just we have just three minutes. I would like to use those three minutes to to thank this um, excellent panel and to just summarize what we have heard. Um, in terms of how do we um, we act, we recognize that gender affects health, and um, there is complete evidence for that. We know that we've made some progress, but there is still a lot to be achieved. So, um, and some of the main issues we have to start addressing immediately are education, making sure that women are educated so that they can, um, they can be part of the system. The pay gap, the gender pay gap needs to be addressed. Um, in terms of what we do about that, we have to um, make gender mainstreaming routine. So when you're designing programs, you have to ask uh, questions around um, how, how well are we mainstreaming gender. Um, we have to create quotas for women, especially in politics. We have to address financial imbalance. We have to legislate equal pay. We have to have transparent um, political processes that, are, that eliminate the structural barriers that are intentionally are designed to keep women away. And then we have to have a clear timetable for when political processes will have. And we have to prepare younger women. So I think with that, we have just um, two minutes to go. And um, I know that there are some questions that have not been answered. Dr. Kweju, there is one about, um, but why six months maternity leave not feasible? So um, I think the organizers will definitely um, reach out to you. And for the panelists, kindly um, respond in the chat to questions that are you feel that you that are addressed to you or you can attend to. But so um, it's been an excellent panel. You would all agree with me that my panelists have done more than justice to this uh, topic. And I wish everybody um, good luck and good health. Continue to be the gender champions that you are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having According us. According to um, Delta Polity, it's more power to women. More power. Yeah. Rookie, we are behind you in 2022. Yeah, yeah rookie, just, rookie, just let us know when you are ready. We'll come there. Don't worry. Prof, I'm coming to you for empowerment. <laughs> <laughs> this was excellent. I really enjoyed this. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys. So from HSG and the Systems Development Initiative, we want to say a big thank you to all our panelists, our lead panelists and our co-panelists for handling this wonderful session. It's really been very intense and very participatory. We are really grateful that you honored our invitation to be here. And to all the participants, we hope you have enjoyed the session and learned a lot of things from this session. Just to remind you that we have a second session in the evening and um, by five to seven, the link is uh, the link will, the link is already in the email that was sent to you. We look forward to having you then. Thank you very much.